Okay, so good evening. Uh, welcome to this Academy of Ideas lockdown debate. Coronavirus has the NHS had a good crisis. I'm Rob Lyons. I'm the Science and Technology Director at the Academy of Ideas and I'll be chairing tonight's discussion. With Boris Johnson's announcements today, this will likely be the last of our lockdown series of debates, but we'll be continuing with plenty of other discussions online and fingers crossed some discussions in the flesh, even if they have to be at one metre plus. Um, the worst of the pandemic now seems to be over, at least for now. Uh, in the week ending 19th of April, there were 8,758 COVID-19 deaths registered in England and Wales. For the week ending 5th of June, that was actually down to 1,588, a fall of 82%. The number of critical care beds in use rose to nearly 3,000 in April, and um, uh, but had actually has now fallen that back down well below 500. So in terms of the pressure on the National Health Service, uh, things uh, are definitely moving in a positive direction. So now is a good moment to take a step back and consider how well the NHS has done. Given that there were well-founded fears in March and April that the health service might be overwhelmed, it seems it has coped just about. It looks like everybody who needed critical care for COVID-19 has had it. NHS staff have worked themselves into the ground to make sure they were, those people were cared for, a considerable risk to themselves, and the weekly clap for carers became a focus of solidarity for those on the front line. But that doesn't mean that there weren't many problems along the way, and by postponing a great deal of care have we merely pushed other problems down the road? While the overall picture seems to be that the NHS has managed, did we fail specific groups of people along the way, from the elderly to ethnic minorities, from cancer patients to those with mental health problems, and many more. There's much to talk about. We have a great panel of speakers who I'm sure will provoke debate about what we should do in the future. Before I introduce them, a small request. Uh, the Academy of Ideas has been working harder than ever during the lockdown. We've had a huge number of online debates and our staff have not been furloughed. All our Zoom events have been free of charge and they still cost money to produce. So if you can help us out, even just the equivalent of the price of a pint, it would be greatly appreciated. Just visit academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate. So, uh, onto the panel. Now, first of all, I have some sorry news. I'm afraid that Dr. Frankie Anderson, who is due to be speaking tonight, has had to cry off. Um, unfortunately, she's got the dreaded lurgy, but fortunately, it's not that dreaded lurgy. Um, so, uh, best wishes to Frankie uh, to make a swift recovery. I don't think it's anything too serious, but um, certainly su su uh, serious enough to uh, not be able to take part tonight. So, on to the other panellists. First to speak will be Henrik Overgaard Nielsen. Uh, Henrik is a, an NHS dentist originally from Denmark. He's always practised in the NHS since he came to live here in the 1990s. He's the former chair of the General Dental Practice Committee, which represents over 30,000 UK dentists. And he's a former Brexit MEP, Brexit Party MEP, sorry, for North West England. After Henrik, we'll have Patrick Vernon. He's Associate Director for Connected Communities at the Centre for Ageing Better, a Quality and Diversity Advisor to Lambeth Council and Chair of Citizens Partnership for Healthcare Investigation Branch. He's also the patron of ACCI, a long-established black mental health charity in Wolverhampton. Third to speak will be Kate Andrews. Kate is the Economics Correspondent at The Spectator and the former Associate Director of the Institute of Economic Affairs and the former Head of Communications at the Adam Smith Institute. Welcome to Kate. And finally, Dr. Lee Jones. Lee is a reader in international politics at Queen Mary University of London. Lee is active in groups resisting the marketization of universities and is co-founder of the Full Brexit Network, uh, which is particularly, uh, there's a piece by Lee on um, the, the Full Brexit website co-written with Tara McCormack called COVID-19 and the failed post-political state. I think it's very, very uh, interesting and uh, educational uh, for tonight's discussion. And uh, Lee's also co-author with Shahar Hamiri of Governing Borderless Threats, a book which deals with the management of pandemics. So I've asked the speakers to give us five minutes or so each for the, of their opening thoughts, just to inspire and kick off a discussion. And I'll bring it out to you for your thoughts and questions. So um, I'm going to spotlight Henrik. Beautifully done, uh, and unmute you as well. So Henrik, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rob. <clears throat> 
Uh, in my five minutes, I'm going to concentrate on a couple of serious issues uh, in relation to the, well, in relation to the incompetence of the management of uh, NHS England and Public Health England. I'm very happy to discuss other issues around dentistry. I wrote an article about the problems uh, for dentistry in this whole, uh, in this whole uh, COVID-19 period. Uh, I'm also very happy to discuss the new uh, track and trace. I have volunteered to become one of the track and tracers. Uh, so I'm happy to discuss that, but five minutes is not a very long time. So I will concentrate on uh, on a couple of, of management issues. We can all agree that the frontline staff uh, during this crisis have been absolutely fantastic. I mean, we have clapped at them uh, every Thursday. They have gone the extra mile. They have done more than, than anybody would have expected. But that doesn't mean that it's a muscle loss. Uh, so we can't discuss the problems that we have seen in the higher echelons of both national health, uh, uh, NHS England and public health England. Simon Stevens, who's the head of NHS England, uh, was in front, together with some of his lieutenants, in front of the health committee uh, at the House of Commons on the 17th of March this year. And I'll just uh, give you a couple of quotes from that, uh, from that time. Uh, they said that there is sufficient supply nationally of PPE and that we have the adequate supply we need. The only problem they raised was that there were some local distribution problems, which they expected would be uh, resolved within a week. And that was the 17th of March. Eight days later, all dentists were told to down tools. Um, we were only allowed to uh, do telephone advice to patients. It was not that dentists were unwilling to treat their patients. We were simply prohibited from doing so and could only do telephone advice. And any patient with, uh, with toothache needing emergency treatment, we were supposed to, to refer to uh, clinics. There were nine in London, emergency clinics that would deal with it. Problem was at that point, and I'm talking about eight days after uh, they said that they had plenty of PPE. Eight days after, those clinics could not work because they did not have proper PPE. That meant that uh, patients, often vulnerable patients, were in pain for weeks. Uh, Laura, my daughter, and I wrote an article about this, uh, and it was put on the website for Telegraph Online. Unfortunately, after a couple of hours, it was taken down again because lawyers from NHS England had complained about the article. One of the things we pointed out in the article was also that the local area teams of NHS England when they managed to source some PPI, PPE, then they did not uh, have the capacity to actually deliver it. So to the nine clinics in London, what they did was they asked some dentists if they could rent vans and then become delivery drivers. You're talking about dentists with 35, 40 years experience uh, driving around delivering uh, PPE. I think it's interesting that the NHS cannot deliver the PPE to where it is needed, but they can check bad publicity within hours. Public Health England was then in front of this time the Science and Technology Committee uh, in April, uh, Science and Technology Committee of the House of Commons. Uh, Professor Sharon Peacock, who is uh, a director of, uh, of PHE, uh, was asked how come that PHE had not managed to get the capacity of testing up to a reasonable standard in April. The reason for the, for the question was, of course, that if you look at Germany, for instance, uh, Germany very quickly managed to get uh, the testing up to uh, a reasonable level because they used all the laboratories that they could find in Germany. However, Public Health England insisted on only using their own laboratories. And I mean, we're not talking about some you know, backstreet garage laboratory here. We are talking of things like the Crick Institute that offered to help in testing and were refused. Uh, and those were the questions that were asked to Public Health England. And I have to say the committee is, as far as I'm aware, still waiting for an answer. That was the reason why the track and trace was abandoned in mid-March. I think everybody agrees that it would have been beneficial to this whole uh, crisis if actually track and trace had worked from mid-March until now. But as the Health and Science Committee, or the Science and Technology Committee, sorry, uh, stated, it was a question of capacity growth strategy rather than 
strategy driving uh, capacity. As I said when we started off, the frontline uh, the frontline staff in NHS has been absolutely fantastic. But when the dust settles, my belief is that Simon Stevens from NHS England and Duncan Selby from Public Health England would come out looking like the Laurel and Hardy of this COVID crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Henrik. A great start. Uh, now I'm going to move over to Patrick. If I spotlight you there. Hello, Patrick. Hi uh, right. Uh, right. I'll just, uh, right. You're far away. The floor Thank is you. yours. Yeah, obviously, five minutes is limited, but you can talk about the NHS. Uh, 5th of July will be the 72nd anniversary of the NHS, which was created uh, in July 1948, which was six weeks before the Empire Woolrush docked in Tilbury in June 1948. And from that period onwards, there has always been a significant presence of black and non ethnic staff working for the NHS from the very beginning of the NHS in 1948. That's the first thing. And obviously, two years on, how many people of black and ethnic minority heritage experiences are at a senior level in the NHS? Not many, I can tell you that. There's hardly any. So it's only about a handful of chief executives. And you have to bear in mind there were approximately 250 NHS bodies, hospital trusts, mental health trusts, specialist trusts. And then obviously you can take into account um, bodies like CQC, NHS England, and other arms length bodies. If you actually look at the totality of the NHS family, uh, it's actually very woeful. We've been... Uh, we've been at the ground, we've been at the beginning of the NHS since its inception, and yet there's hardly many people of colour working at strategic level in hospital trusts, in mental health trusts, in NHS England, and even in the Department of Health. And then what happened with the coronavirus situation? People were dropping like flies. Frontline staff, often perceived as um, not skilled enough, and even if there was there were clinicians, there were a number of consultants and doctors who died on the front line of Muslim heritage and different ethnic backgrounds. And it took the BMA, it took the Royal College of Nursing, and it took activists and organisations like myself to say to the Department of Health and to and to Matt Hancock and to Boris Johnson, you're not taking seriously the contribution of beaming people who have made a difference to the NHS for the last 72 years. And actually what ha also happened was a lot of BME staff, some of them were reassigned to COVID wards without the necessary and proper PPE, not taking into account their health conditions. And so it matters worse, the government completely didn't take this seriously. They were forced um, to then say, well, commission Public Health England to do a comprehensive scientific review of the evidence around the high levels of deaths of beaming people, frontline staff, and in the wider community. We don't know the actual numbers, to be quite honest, of how many people in Britain of, of, of black and minority ethnic background have died of COVID, because one of the main reasons is actually on death certificates, we don't record ethnic monitoring. So we can guesstimate, we can look at data and stuff like that. And luckily, we do know about the frontline staff because luckily for the media and, and, and gratefully for the families of those loved ones who've died, they've been able to share their stories. Otherwise, we wouldn't have known more about this. If you can remember one time, Matt Hancock was on Question Time and he was asked the question, do you know how many nurses have died of COVID-19? And he couldn't even answer that question. That tells you the lack of intent and commitment around issues around culture and diversity. So that's the first, that's an issue I want to make. I've worked in the NHS, I've worked um, as a senior manager for a number of years, I've worked as civil servants and Department of Health, I've sat on NHS boards um, for the last 15 years from mental health trusts to commissioning groups, GP cooperative, you name it, I've got, and plus I've been a politician, I've been a councillor, 
uh, in Hackney where I chair health scrutiny. So in terms of my experiences of looking at the NHS and the issue of diversity, it's wo woeful. Um, Simon Stevens, when he first got appointed as Chief Executive of NHS England, um, to be fair to him, the first thing he actually did, um, and there was a uh, quasi diversity meeting, which I was in attendance one, he actually adopted um, Rod Roger Klein's report, Snow White -like Peaks. And in that report, that report highlighted high levels of bullying, harassment and discrimination of BME staff at all levels, not just cleaners, I'm talking about um, senior clinicians as well. And that led to the development of what is known as the work, Workforce Race Equality Programme, which for the last several years has been monitoring every single NHS trust body in this country to make sure how they're stamping up bullying and harassment of BME staff, how they're progressing the careers of BME staff in the NHS, and what is the culture of that organisation when it comes to quality of services for the community. That has been further reinforced by the Care Quality Commission in their, in their inspection regimes, where they use the criteria of well-led to measure how effective NHS organisations are around delivery of equality. Through the COVID-19 situation, what is very clear and what is very apparent is that it's not working because BME staff have been let down by the NHS, by the government, in terms of the number of people who've died. They've been let down in terms of not given the opportunity of opportunity around their career progression. And also in terms of delivery of NHS services in the wider community, there's a fearful factor that they don't want to really engage, uh, which, is, which means we'll have a disproportionate impact of those people range of living in care homes and the wider community. Now, with the question we need to ask yourself, we're approaching 77, the 72nd anniversary of, of the NHS. I'm sure there will be a more hand clapping going on. And, and it's also, we, we have, as all of us in Britain, we are very proud of the NHS. But it's like a, a bittersweet experience. We want to, we've, we, we want the NHS to excel and to, because it's about healthcare and we have a, a, a emotional financial investment in that. But at the same time, it's not meeting the needs of BME communities. It's not meeting the needs of BME staff working there. And it requires a fundamental change for the future if we want it to make it a world-class, inclusive, intersectional service for all. Brilliant. Okay, thanks very much, Patrick. Well, you've certainly packed it in. <laughs> Thank you for those important points, uh, right. Uh, so. We move on to uh, to Kate, and uh, can you unmute yourself? Yep, have done. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Off you go. Yeah. Thank you so much to the Academy of Ideas for hosting us. Um, I think because you get such an emotional response around the National Health Service when you talk about it, uh, you know, in terms of its workers, its staff, in relation to public policy you often get people classifying different chunks of it based on whether or not they think something's gone well or poorly. So what I mean by this is when we're talking about the frontline staff, those who have braved it the past few months going into hospital treating COVID patients, putting themselves at risk, we talk about them as the NHS and people are very proud of them and they're happy to praise them. When we talk about failings, when we talk about lack of ventilators or PPE, when we talk about decisions to prioritize certain patients over others, when things go wrong, it's not the NHS, it's the government. But the problem with this kind of separating out the different chunks of good and bad is that it is a nationalized healthcare system. It is one of the most nationalized systems still in the developed world. And because of that, you, you really can't separate it. You have, to, you have to look at it in the round. So when we're asking whether or not the NHS has had a good crisis, I think you have to take all of those things into account. Um, and as Patrick and Henrik have already said, I don't think there's any doubt that frontline staff have been phenomenal, um, that they were brave, that they showed up, that they did what they needed to do. And let's not just think about that in the context of what we know now about the virus, which for many people is still very frightening. You don't want to underplay that. But uh, the more we've learned about it, the more we know that a lot of people aren't at high risk, especially if they're in younger age groups and don't have certain underlying health conditions. Um, we did not see the worst case projections come to fruition in this country. Um, 
we're talking about staff that showed up at the end of March and, and throughout March when we really had no idea how big the death toll was going to be. When we thought that a quarter of a million people could die from this virus, um, you know, staff showed up then and they put their lives on the line. So I don't think anybody has any doubt that they, you know, deserve all the applause they got and, and have done a great job. But then you can't overlook the fact that the UK has, is approaching anyway, one of the highest death tolls in Europe. I know those stats are contested and they should be because we don't have all the information yet, but it's not looking great. There's no way you can say that the UK has been one of the better European countries in keeping the death toll down. There were some catastrophic decisions made at the beginning of this crisis to move elderly patients out of hospital and into care homes without so much as a COVID test in order to build capacity into hospitals. Now, you can try to justify that. There are arguments that might back you up. We saw what was happening in Northern Italy, 40, 50 year olds dying in tents because they couldn't get an access, access to a hospital bed. And, and the NHS did not want to see a repeat of that, but it turned out that we sent many, many elderly people to their deaths in care homes. And that is a, a huge tragedy, possibly the biggest tragedy of this crisis that we'll see. Um, and we've had other, you know, issues of, of, of not just mess ups, but hubris. The NHS X app failed before it properly launched. I mean, unsurprisingly to most people outside of government, Apple and Google are better at creating a framework for an app than UK bureaucrats, but that was unknown to the bureaucrats at the time. And now we are months behind. We don't think we're going to have an app online until the autumn to properly track and trace this virus. Um, you have non-COVID patients uh, whose tragedies we haven't seen play out yet, but there are already estimates about the possibly tens of thousands of people who will die of cancer unnecessarily because they were denied access to treatment. The NHS was so good at shutting down everything else and building in capacity for COVID patients that many, many other conditions have been left left untreated. And, and we're not going to see the reality of that for years, but we do know that it's coming. Um, in many ways, what makes a good rationing system is that it's able to do that. And the UK being nationalized and centralized based on, on rationing and its healthcare system was, was able to pull that off. But we know the ugly side of that, which is that non-COVID patients um, will have suffered because of that. Um, and I think Henrik already covered uh, the abysmal um, uh, efforts of, of Public Health England really across the board. It, it didn't have the equipment that was needed for doctors and nurses and care staff. Uh, it would not let private clinics or charities get involved in helping to increase testing capacity when it was needed most. It turns out that it's been prioritizing its budgets on nanny statism rather than actually trying to prepare for a global pandemic. I mean, it's really been failure across the board. So when we talk about the NHS, at least when I talk about it, very often people quickly say that you are criticizing those who are working within it because we refer to everything that I've just talked about as the NHS. And that is what you get when you have a nationalized healthcare system. It is all encompassing. Um, and I think it's really important to break down which elements have been successful and which haven't. And uh, I have to say, I'm having been critical of the NHS in, in now quite a long time in the UK in the way that it operates compared to other European countries. Um, I am not at all surprised that staff perform brilliantly, but that the system and structures around them failed them many steps of the way. Uh, Patrick's mentioned some of the ways uh, in which uh, certain communities and, and people of color have been failed by the NHS. I think that really, um, uh, I didn't know a lot of that, that really spoke to me, but it, it extends across the board as well to, to non-COVID patients and, and so many people who will have been failed by the structure, not by the workers, but by the structures. So did the NHS have a good crisis? Um, no doubt that those who worked in it did a fantastic job, but I think its vulnerabilities are really magnified now. Um, and when this crisis is over, whenever that may be, it will be a time to look to other countries and to see how their healthcare systems fared. No doubt all healthcare systems were under strain, but which ones passed the strain test and which ones struggled more? That's what I'm going to be looking out for. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kate. And finally, uh, I'll turn to Lee, and uh, I think you're set to go. Lee. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so if we think 
the question of whether the NHS has had a, a good crisis depends on, as Kate just said, on what we think is the NHS. Uh, if we think about the NHS as a national religion, then clearly it has had a good crisis. But if we think about the NHS as an organisation that is meant to deliver high quality health care to the British public, I don't think it's had a good crisis at all. Now, to cope effectively with the pandemic, you need at least two related things. You need good planning and you need plenty of spare capacity. And the NHS had neither. And that's not because it is nationalised and centralised. It's really quite the opposite. It's because because of its political mismanagement, the NHS has become fragmented, responsibilities widely dispersed, and the health service has become marketised. So did the NHS have good planning? No. Uh, UK healthcare governance has become incredibly Byzantine and bureaucratic with responsibility dispersed across dozens of different regulators, quangos, commissioners, providers, public and private, NHS, non-NHS non -NHS bodies. And ministers of all parties have pursued this approach to shift responsibility away from themselves and to facilitate marketization and privatization. And this outsourcing of responsibility has extended to pandemic planning. If you look at the government's pandemic preparedness strategy, which was first issued under New Labour in 2005 and then updated in 2011, it effectively outsourced all practical preparations to local resilience fora, including NHS and public bodies, and sectoral regulators, businesses, even individuals. It devotes no new resources or capacities. It relies entirely on established systems and NHS surge planning. Now, did the NHS have lots of spare capacity? Obviously not. Uh, it never has had very much capacity. Um, as Kate mentioned also, uh, from its inception, the NHS has been about rationing healthcare. That became very obvious to me when I, I worked briefly in the health service. Um, the NHS routinely ranks very highly, often at the top of international comparisons of healthcare, but that is for efficiency and not outcomes. What that means is it's devoted medical staff do remarkable amounts of work, given how poorly resourced they are. So Britain's healthcare spending per capita is below the average for developed European economies. By 2017, therefore, our health outcomes, our levels of health and well-being, were already comparable to those in post-Soviet states like the Czech Republic. Over the past 30 years, the number of NHS hospital beds has more than halved, and occupancy rates were already over 90% by January 2020. Now, the provision of critical care beds was an exception to this. It actually increased in recent years, but still, there were only uh, 5,900 critical care beds by January 2020, and occupancy rates were already over 80%. So critical care units uh, provision per capita was well below other major European countries. Germany, for example, has over four times our level. Now, we now know that that capacity was ultimately not exceeded. But as the pandemic hit, there was real and justifiable fear that the NHS's limited capacity would be very quickly overwhelmed. And this is where the NHS's poor planning combines with inadequate capacity. The two very fateful decisions were made when on the 17th of March, the NHS Chief Executive Sir Simon Stevens activated the surge planning mechanisms at the heart of UK pandemic preparedness. This was designed to free up capacity in NHS hospitals. The first decision, and this was probably the most disastrous decision of the entire crisis, was the discharging of 25,000 elderly patients from hospitals directly into care homes. I think it will be recognised subsequently that this seeded COVID-19 into the most vulnerable part of the population at the precise moment when personal protective equipment, PPE, and COVID testing wasn't available. Now, the reasons for that are I can't go into in the brief introduction, but they relate to massive cuts in public health spending and the privatisation of the NHS supply chain. That is almost entirely responsible for the inadequate stocks of PPE at the start of the crisis. Now, by seeding COVID into care homes, that means that 55% of excess deaths in this country have occurred in care homes. The second big decision was that hospitals were directed to postpone all non-essential care. Now, a well-managed, well-resourced health system 
would be able to segregate facilities and keep important services running alongside critical care. The NHS couldn't do this. The National Health Service became the National COVID-19 Service. So if we compare April this year with April last year, A&E attendances were down 57%. Cancer assessments were down 60%. Routine operations were down 85%. Even cancer treatments have been cancelled. I personally know of two people recovering from cancer who died during the pandemic as a result. This has no doubt compounded the pandemic's death toll. If we look from early March to early June, excess deaths are 43% higher than normal, and a fifth of these excess deaths weren't COVID related. There'll also be a lasting burden from vastly increased waiting times, missed cancer and stroke detection, and increased rates of problems like depression, alcoholism, and so on arising from lockdown. So in short, I think uh, the heroic efforts of NHS frontline workers aside, the NHS as an organization has not had a good crisis. We were directed to protect the NHS when the NHS should have been protecting us. And I think we do need a national public debate to uncover the root causes of this failure and to map out a new course for public health care, which will be one where elected officials take more responsibility, not less, and where the public good is prioritised over rationing and profiteering. Thanks. Excellent stuff. That's, that's four really, really useful um, contributions there. Um, so, th so thank you all. So, uh, now, I'm not going to start firing questions at the panel because I think that they're in a very different ways to tackle this issue uh, in a really interesting, uh, provocative way. So I'm just going to come straight out to you and uh, get your points and questions. So I'm going to, uh, panellists, I'm going to take a half a dozen at a go and then maybe get you to come in and sort of pick out ones that you want to respond to. So I'll start with um, uh, Johnny Morris. Johnny. Hello, can you unmute yourself? I'm unmuted. Hello. All right, so Hi, I, I was just going to address the the uh, the the issue of the people getting discharged too soon into care homes. I, I've been looking at this and thinking about it, and of course, this isn't a this isn't a problem local to the UK. You know, it's it's exactly the same thing happened in New York, Spain, Italy, Sweden. They've got different health services, but exactly the same issues applied. You've got to say. Yeah, there were local issues, and I'll bow to Lee and all the rest of the experts on this as to what was going wrong within the NHS. But well, something else systematic, systemic was going wrong with health itself. And I think, I think it's down to the, to the sort of um, to the Western medical model. With, within the medical model desk discourse, there are, anything that doctors do is medical. Anything else is not medical. They've got a clear boundary around it, and that boundary is instantiated in the NHS. So. What happens is, and, and within the NHS, there are boundaries within boundaries. There's social closure within the NHS. A hospital is not there to treat patients. A hospital is, is specialism centric. So it, the respiratory departments that were responsible for the uh, corona, um, COVID thing, was, were doing the best they could. And we're all praising the frontline staff. So anybody who's prepared to go into that, you know, the unknown in March is an extremely brave person, right? I mean, you know, we can't deny that. But within within those units, as soon as people, because they were respiratory units, as soon as they finished doing respiratory stuff, they wanted them out of there. Because the hospital didn't see long-term care and never has seen long-term care as a, health, as a medical issue, they were shipped off into the they were shipped off into the into the care homes and this happened around the world so i think what what we got here is is but sometimes we're too close to our own problem i think there's a real problem if we if we come into the next emergency and that might not be medical who knows what it's going to be there's a real problem with relying on people who can only work within their own discourse can't see outside of that and you can tell uh, this is okay, Johnny. Can I just say because I want to get as many people in, so that's, okay, thank that's you. A quite a quite a good start. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, right, uh, Paul Butterworth, if you can unmute yourself. Great. Hi, 
Uh, so I, 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 uh, I work for the NHS, but um, in the uh, uh, non-PPE requiring IT uh, area. And um, I, I think that um, it, 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 it is important to recognise that there have been some um, successes that the NHS has, has, has been able to deliver through COVID uh, uh, because of its, um, its national nature. Uh, I think, that, uh, I believe that um, uh, the UK has the, the third highest number of um, antigen tests uh, that have been uh, delivered, for example, um, and, and various uses of, of national um, data sets have, have been made to enable identification of patients requiring shielding, for example, and, um, uh, uh, and also to, to support development of, um, of uh, treatments. However, uh, I think it's also true to say that um, <laughs> yeah, th there is no such thing as, as a national health service, and, and, and that's partly been, been the problem. There, there, are, there are many ways in which you, know, you would think that um, one of the advantages of, um, of a national service would, would be um, uh, 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 brought to, to bear in a, in, a, in a national crisis. And, but what we've seen is uh, a very much agree with what uh, Lee Jones said that, that what we've seen is the operation of, of the various different fiefdoms that, that there are in place in the NHS so you know, for, even you know, within the UK we have you know, we have four different chief medical officers with the different nations we have taught four different deputy chief medical officers and that that goes all the way down through the structure um, and then within even the English NHS, between NHS England, Public Health England, NHS X, NHS Digital, exactly who is responsible for um, for, for uh, defining what needs to be delivered and then managing it is um, is often very confused, and um, and and so those successes in many ways have been delivered despite the NHS structure rather than because of it. So I, I think it's, uh, there, there, are, there are questions to, to explore about the relationship between the public and the private sector. Um, much of the IT that's been delivered, um, uh, that you, you arguably should have been there anyway, but um, much of the IT that's been delivered to support COVID has been delivered primarily by the private sector, for example. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think the, the, the NHS has, has failed to leverage its, its national capability. Oh, okay, brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Right, um, Noah, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, I thank, thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, and a really great point. It's just a few uh, quick things from me. We often see that the NHS, um, even before COVID, it was almost the one thing that united the public, whatever side of the political spectrum they were, supporting increased funding. And so that's almost why that Protect the NHS message was so affected. Uh, but I wonder whether it's so effective. I wonder whether the panellists thought it was actually so effective it could almost not protect the NHS in the future because of things like cancer care, mental health, the obesity crisis, things that could have been exacerbated both as a result of the lockdown, people feeling that they shouldn't go to their GPs even when they should uh, have gone. And so actually in the future by saying protect the NHS this time next year it may be in a you know even more of a crisis than it faces. Um, secondly I wonder what the panelists about almost the balance between a centralised and localised response in, in, for the NHS in general because while a localised response could be helpful if the R rate goes up in a particular part of the country a lack of a centralised approach from Westminster could be sort of damaging for accountability and for any sort of inquiry in terms of who is or who isn't held responsible for what's gone wrong. Um, also, I wonder what the panel thought about the role and powers of the health secretary, both during COVID and within the NHS generally, uh, because we often hear about the Health and Social Care Act of 2012 um, with the Andrew Lansley reforms. And it's been interesting to hear about you know, NHS England and Public Health England and actually just sort of food for thought on, you know, what are the powers of the health secretary and should they have more or less powers compared to other bodies? Uh, and finally, I wonder what the panel thought about whether COVID would speed up and the relationship between the NHS and social care, not least because of the disastrous policy of, you know, discharging patients, but also generally as we enter a more ageing society and social care being um, further pushed up the agenda when actually it's been ignored by politicians for decades. Thank you. A comprehensive set of questions there. Uh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, Jagdish. Okay. Right. Um, hi. Hi. Um, I think that there is a temptation in this kind of discussion to rehearse all the criticisms and opinions that people have had about the National Health Service 
pre before the coronavirus kind of came in. So people may talk about race issues, mismanagement, etc. But all of those, quite a few of those were pre existing. So I think we've got to be able to distinguish what is different about the response of the NHS in this particular crisis. And I think that is probably more instructive. Uh, so when it comes to, you know, a black and minority ethnic staff, whether we're talking about efficiency and effectiveness and so on of the national service, you know, some of those things were pre-existing. I think some of the things that stood out were, because the, the NHS does not control the demand. The demand is generated by either government interference, policy, procedures, strategies set by the government. Uh, the NHS is an institution that's just responsible for, you know, so you look at the inputs, the processing and outputs, when it comes to NHS. And uh, the input is entirely controlled by external factors and not the NHS. Um, sure, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from it, but I think got to be to try and kind of learn the lessons specific to this virus and the coronavirus period. I think you've got to really look at the things which are specific to it. I personally admired the flexibility with which the NHS was able to kind of marshal all the resources to try and get, you know, uh, the beds and so on ready for people. So apart from one hospital, they actually didn't get overwhelmed. They didn't. Uh, and so that was quite a, a useful thing, but they were not in control of the tap. They didn't control the tap or the demand. Uh, the, so I think we've got to look at, uh, a lot of people are talking about things which are directly as a result of policy or strategy uh, set by the government. I, you know, from the arguments around herd, herd in immunity versus the lockdown, when the lockdown came in, this alleged thing that somehow it's all led by science, but actually it may, maybe on the periphery have a scientific view, but the politicians make the decision. They had all the PPE fiasco. And, you know, I remember more than other five, six weeks ago that Matt Hancock said, oh, like we're dealing with it properly. We actually, it's a supply, it's a logistics and supply issue. Actually, we got somebody from the army. We've got a black belt in organizing logistics and they, you know, we got it sorted. So they had the best people involved in logistics and weeks later it's still a complete fiasco. So I, I don't know, I think it, there are a lot of issues which are not directly related to the NHS, which we've got to filter out of it to look at what is specific to the NHS and the way the NHS has dealt with this crisis. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to bring the panel back in shortly. I'm just going to take Simon Belt and Jacob Reynolds and then um, come, come back to you. So, um, Simon Belt. Yeah. Thanks. Brilliant introductions and great questions. So I think the care homes and cancer and stroke stuff that I was going to ask about has been covered. So picking up on a point that uh, Lee Jones kind of introduced about whether the NHS had a, a, a good uh, crisis in terms of uh, its religious um, status. A lot of discussions over the last week um, that I've had with people that I know have been extremely critical of uh, not necessarily the officialdom of the NHS, but NHS workers. Um, and the, in some ways about the structure and officialdom, but they, uh, a lot of people are very aware that a lot of NHS workers, nurses, have been sat around doing nothing because of that process of protect the NHS and clear everyone out of uh, the health service, uh, either into care homes or to frighten them to coming into the NHS. So the kind of saintly image of nurses uh, crying on videos on Facebook has been profoundly punctured with a, a section of people, not everyone, uh, but a section of people. And that came out particularly poignantly when um, in Manchester, it was all over the news, but there was a rave of like 15,000 people. And a load of them were nurses who, you know, a lot of people knew and two weeks earlier were posting videos uh, crying about how the NHS was overwhelmed and everything. And yet the same nurses are out raving with 15,000 other people. And then the next day when all the shops open and NHS workers get to uh, get there first, 
they're in there buying stuff uh, at 50% reduction for NHS staff. And so the, the point is, there's not a rabid kickback. I'm not having a rabid kickback at nurses, but that sense of religiosity towards the NHS, I don't think is uniform. And I think it might happen at a kind of structural uh, level of officialdom but it's not necessarily the case for a lot of ordinary people. So the question is really about how, how far is that religi religiosity punctured? Okay, uh, Jacob. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just unmuted you. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, yeah, what, one question and one uh, challenge as well. So the question is something I really can't figure out, get my head around is how the discussion that was highlighted a bit by Lee and by Kate about how the sort of decentralization or the, the, the way in which the, there's conflicting lines of responsibility and bureaucratization, how that plays out when we recognize that one of the big successes in other countries was precisely the sort of decentralization of testing and allowing sort of anybody to get involved and pitched in. So that's my sort of, I'd like you to, is that the difference between centralization and federalization or what's quite going on there? Cause is it, cause Lee, I think sometimes suggested that the problem in the NHS is not centralized enough. So what, how does that play out? The challenge as it were for, for us all, or especially for those people who work in the NHS is that one of the positive things that I read a, as several times and saw a lot on social media was the way in which people the actual clinical staff were bypassing lots of the bureaucratization and management crap that has seeped into the NHS. So my question to the panel is, how do you capitalize on that? Obviously, I mean, there was a sort of hilarious article in the Financial Times a few weeks ago where they tried to suggest that that was the direct result of all sending loads of staff on all these trendy management courses. But something genuine seems to have happened where people were able to bypass all the crap that seeped into the NHS over a period of time and actually sort of treat like focus on the real needs. How does that, how do we intensify that? Is it just a question of funding or funding the NHS properly or is there a sort of bigger issue at play there? Okay, brilliant, no. Um, I'll bring Henrik in. Uh, um, obviously feel free to uh, comment on whatever you want, but considering we're talking about different health systems and how they've performed, I, I assume you have a fair understanding of the Danish health system. And since Denmark's had a much better crisis perhaps than we have over here, if you want to comment on that, uh, those differences, uh, please do, but feel free to comment on whatever you like. Henrik. All right. Uh, <clears throat> well, there are a lot of, a lot of things happening here. Uh, I do agree that, and I think I mentioned that as well, uh, we need to, to have a grown-up discussion. Uh, the religiosity, as, as I think Simon was, was, was talking about, uh, is, is really not what we need. We need to have a grown-up discussion. Having worked within the NHS and having you know, negotiated with the Department of Health and NHS England for, for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that, I think the standard thing, if you've been in the system for a while, is that it changes all the time but if you stand still in the NHS, it is all going to come around and hit you in the ass. It is politicians that need to change things because they want to put their stamp on it. You go from very local things like uh, primary care trusts to slightly bigger things and area health authorities. And then you go to even bigger areas and then you end up coming down uh, local again. I'm not sure the the big discussion point here is whether the decisions are taken centrally or locally. I think it's a question of taking the right decisions and actually and have some, uh, some strategic uh, ideas coming from the center and then for local people to have the flexibility to actually deal with it. Uh, the problem we've seen here is that most of the stuff has been done very centralized and it's the wrong uh, decisions that have been made. When you look at Denmark, Denmark is, is, is different in the sense that obviously we are only five and a half million people uh, it is decentralized quite a lot. The hospitals are decentralized quite a lot. Uh, but in Denmark, I think they've had about 600 deaths in total. And, you know, we are a tenth of the population here. So if you try and, and, and multiply that up, that would mean that the UK should have had about 6,000 deaths. Uh, Norway has had even fewer. It might have something to do with maybe spending a bit more money uh, having a bit of extra capacity. I think particularly for Norway, that is a big thing. Uh, they have got uh, epidemiologists and infection uh, control nurses and doctors in, very, in every small area. 
uh, and that has definitely helped. Whereas Sweden, of course, have gone the opposite way and opened up very much. But talking to Swedish friends of mine, they, they are saying that the problem in Sweden has very much, not so much been that they didn't do lockdown, but they've had the same problems with, um, with their care homes. It's the care homes that have taken the vast majority of deaths, actually, like they have done in, 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 uh, in this country uh, here as well. I think there's an important issue that we need to, to look at as well when it comes to people not going to have their cancer checked out, not having uh, operations and things like that, and that's demand management. I think the politicians and, and, and the central doctors frightened everybody completely when we were mid-March, and nobody dared going anywhere uh, to have anything checked. Uh, demand management is something that the NSS has not been very good at. Uh, I can tell you now from, from uh, a dentist's perspective that they just told us uh, that dental practices would open up 10 days ago. Uh, and everybody thought that they could go and have their normal dental treatment in their normal dental practice. The problem is that we, were not, we are not allowed to do that. We can only do temporary fillings and pull out teeth. So the number of people that want to have a crown, want their dentures done, want whatever they want done, cannot have that done. But it is left to the dentists to try and demand manage instead of the politicians to do that. And that, I think, is a great fault of the NHS. And they, that's something that really needs to change, both for dentists, of course, but also for pharmacies, hospitals and GPs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick. Sure. So, yeah, lots of questions from the uh, panel. Um, I'll try and pick on some of them. Um, the conversation about the the religious or or the how we see the NHS holding them now. Um, actually, we've got this bit, it's a bit of a contradiction, even though there are some problems with the NHS. But ironically, the COVID nineteen has made it into a good crisis. There has been an increased number of people going onto NHS appointments websites wanted to work for the NHS. There's been an actual increase in people thinking about a career in the NHS. So that tells you that people still value the NHS. And I think um, if the public were asked by the government to increase taxes by extra couple of pence for extra investment, I think the majority of people would say yes. So, so in, on one level, despite the, the shortcomings that we've identified, the NHS is still, it's still got this homilier perspective still that's the first thing the second thing is the the um the coronavirus pandemic has exposed the inequalities in society uh you know in terms of the impact on people on people's lifestyles uh, and that's reflected in the high number of deaths so part of those inequalities which the pandemic has um exposed is the lack of, of investment i think that was already identified in our conversation one billion pounds have been lost in public sector and public health funding over the last 10 years and it highlights the weakness and vulnerability and delivery of public health particularly at the local forest level which is all linked to the NHS reforms done by Lansley it reflects a lack of commitment by government to invest in public health because otherwise I think we could have managed the pandemic much better in many ways um, we have this central control scenario and I think also um, it highlighted the inequ racial inequalities in the NHS. So, yes, some of those stuff were pre-existing, but you can't. But um, you can't tell me that. that um, I think it's been over 120, 30, maybe more. Frontline staff have died in the NHS, and you know, a majority of those have been black, not ethnic. You can't tell me that. Oh, that's pre-existing. No, they died because of COVID-19, and they died because of COVID-19 because they, weren't, they were forced into those COVID wards without proper PPEs. And that was for the highlight, that's been further highlighted by that box report done by Public Health England, where part of it was suppressed and not public pressure. It was leaked by Sky and BBC. Then the government had to publish the full report a few days ago. And, that's, and that tells you that the government was hiding from the issue of race, discrimination and the report actually identified structural racism that has always been there but the, the COVID-19 has further exposed that as well. Another area um, that the COVID-19 has exposed is the poor relation between social care. What's quite clear 
that if we're going to move forward as a society, we need to seriously invest in social care in terms of the whole way that majority of care homes are run in the private sector, the way that people's terms and conditions of employment are not on the same status and parity compared to NHS staff, and also in terms of how we treat and value older people in society. And that is quite clearly a key thing that's been, that's been further highlighted and exposed by COVID-19. And the final okay, point I want to make, uh, yeah, yes. okay. sorry, the final point uh, I want to make is that we make various international comparisons. Yes, the NHS is the third largest, third, it's the biggest employer in Britain and the third largest employer uh, in the world. And we always compare the, the GDP spent on the healthcare. What is quite clear now that there is now a case that we have to spend more of our GDP on healthcare, public health, compared to Norway, Sweden. Uh, you can't compare to America because it's a different health system. But in terms of our European partners, you know, it, that's the case that more investment in public health and the healthcare systems. Great, thanks very much, Patrick. Uh, Kate, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, right. Great question. So Jagdish mentioned the flexibility that's come in into the NHS and Jacob piggybacked on this slightly and I'm no expert. I don't know why they've been able to essentially bend the rules and become significantly more efficient and, and sort of take more direct and, and individualist decisions um, for their patients during this time, but they have. I, I imagine the this, this simple state of crisis has had a lot to do with that. People aren't asking as many questions and the advice is just get the job done. And um, there've been plenty of reports that we've read and seen from doctors and nurses saying they hope that it stays this way. Um, so, you know, stay tuned. But I think it is very fair to, to flag that up as, as a success. It does turn out that within the NHS, there is that capacity for creativity, let's call it. Um, but it, it didn't show up until a crisis, um, which is of course problematic. Um, Noah said, you know, was protect the NHS too effective of a slogan. And I think you can make quite a convincing argument that it was. It's no surprise that the government's original slogan to make everybody stay inside and stop using the health service was protect the NHS. It does speak to that religious status that it has. But I think, you know, on top of, of, of pulling on heartstrings due to the NHS, and, um, you know, there was a lot of fear sloshing around, some of it very legitimate, but I think as time has gone on and we've come to learn more about the crisis, perhaps it went on for too long. Um, and now that's really ingrained and it's going to be interesting to see if, if people um, take up these new liberties that we get on the 4th of July. Um, I'm, I'm certainly hoping that those who are safe to do so will, but the UK compared to many other Europeans, um, Brits have just been much more nervous to go back out there. Um, so that, I do think that's quite telling. Um, Jacob mentioned centralized systems. I wasn't trying to imply that I was a fan of them. Um, indeed, it's the opposite. I was just saying that the UK has one. Yes, there are devolved powers, but if we compare the UK's healthcare system, in fact, if we just compare the UK on tax structures, on housing and planning, certainly on healthcare, to its European counterparts, um, it is one of the most centralized on, on all of those fronts. And as you said, Jacob, countries like Germany, because they were so decentralized in their approach to healthcare, have been much more successful in being able to deal with the regional issues because COVID in many ways is a regional virus. How it affects one area does not necessarily affect, affect the other. Um, I'll have to disagree with, with Patrick a little bit. I, I think we do have to tease out those, those differences between Sweden and Denmark and Germany and France. It isn't the USA versus everybody else. Most countries do not have the nationalized healthcare system that Britain does. Um, it, people talk about Britain's healthcare system being the envy of the world, but it, it really isn't, as Lee mentioned, when it comes to patient outcomes, because um, despite people saying that it is, very few countries have actually adopted it, certainly not like for like. Um, and so it's, I think it really is important, especially after the crisis, that, that we look at those that we look at those differences and you know we're starting now to, to kind of get back into the politics of it to talk about money and privatization within the NHS. I, I will disagree with Lee and say that um, I think there's very limited evidence of real privatization in the NHS. The King's Fund, which is very on board with a single payer system like the NHS even says, you know, it's roughly 10% of the NHS budget that goes on things that we would deem private, but 
most of that isn't actual healthcare provision. It's bringing in hospital beds and hospital food. So, you know, unless you're going to go the full way and say that should all be provided by the state, most all the vast majority of healthcare in the UK is, is provided um, through strictly public means. Uh, and I think you can see countries like Germany, but many others in Europe that have fared slightly better because they weren't set up in that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really do want to draw out those comparisons. I don't want to lump Europe together because there are serious distinctions between uh, the UK and even France. Okay, great. Uh, Lee, do you want to unmute yourself and respond to all and everything? Well, yeah, a few selected points. I'll, res I'll respond to two points. And one is um, uh, Jacob's very good question about centralization versus fragmentation. And I'm not sure if I can I can do this, but if I can, I will show you a diagram. Are you able to see that? <laughs> yeah. So the, the UK has this very perverse combination of, of centralization and fragmentation at the same time, which might not seem to make any sense. But once you understand the model that uh, infects not just the UK, but many other states as well as being regulatory state, then you can understand. This is a, this is an organogram of the NHS in England, only in England, because in other parts of the country they have their own systems, right? So you can see the immense fragmentation of this system. This is not a centralised system. Uh, there are different bits here, re regional bits, local area teams. Uh, there are different quangos, regulatory bodies. There's the clinical commissioning groups that actually decide what care is going to be provided and so on. And when you look within any of these bodies, so for example, if we look inside the clinical commissioning groups, there's all, there's all other bits inside there as well. So it's intensely fragmented um, because there has been this big push in the last 30 years to disperse responsibility away from elected officials um, in, in central government and disperse authority across non-elected bodies uh, that are supposed to be more expert, closer to the ground, more able to make decisions and so on, which sounds great, right? Put power to the people, blah, blah. But the reality, and this is where the continued aspect of centralization comes in, is that these bodies uh, uh, like NICE or Health Watch England, Public Health England and so on, they're all cascading their own regulatory ideas down uh, the chain. So the regulatory state operates not by taking direct operational control of things and saying, right, we want to have X number of beds there, that number of services there in this strategic kind of command and control way, like, like, like the post-war state or like a Soviet economy or something like that. Control or kind of operational decisions are left to the lower levels, but they are bombarded with bureaucratic regulation and they are regulated to within an inch of their lives. And then you add to that, uh, international regulation which trickles down and has then to be implemented and cascade down the system and you can see how uh, confusing this system becomes and you can see how it crushes professionalism it crushes autonomy it crushes the ability of people to make decisions for themselves and they spend all their time showing that they're compliant with this or that other framework this is not unique to britain it is not unique to the nhs it is a problem that plagues the public sector in all kinds of contexts. I work in a university, we are regulated to within an inch of our lives. It's exactly the same. So that is how the system functions and it is dysfunctional. So people, you know, somebody said, oh, we're talking about things that pre-existed COVID. This is why, because this is the system that existed before COVID struck and it wasn't able to cope with the pandemic. So of course we have to look at things before that. The second point I want to address, and this will be the final point, is to do with privatization. And I mentioned in my introduction that uh, the reason why PPE wasn't available was because of the privatization of NHS uh, supply chain, which is the main body that is responsible for centralizing procurement. There's an attempt to centralize procurement, take it out of the hands of local trusts, but then also privatize it. So it shows how these two things go in tandem. There's an attempt to fragment, which allows the private sector to come in, um, but there's also a centralization effort. So this is an organogram of NHS supply chain. And you can see that it is fragmented across 11 different uh, contracts, uh, 
uh, which have been awarded to mostly private companies, mostly incompetent middlemen that don't actually produce and supply the items that they're supposed to, to provide. They're just middlemen that source these things overwhelmingly internationally. And so uh, what happens um, is that they're operating on just-in-time uh, basis. So they don't tend to stockpile. That helps them to keep their profits up. That's the exact opposite of what you need in a pandemic. And they rely on global supply chains. So as demand spikes and global supply chains collapse, these companies could not source uh, PPE adequately, which is why they were scrambling around, competing with one another, and importing unsafe and deficient equipment. Now, it's worth saying that even the stockpile to deal with pandemics was outsourced. It had been outsourced to a private company called Movianto. And uh, the stockpile had been reduced in value by 40% between 2013 and 2018. By January this year, Movianto stocks were 10 to 28% lower than the levels recommended in 2009. Key equipments like gowns, visors, and swabs were missing, and 45% of stock had expired, although some of this was then relabeled and redistributed. So uh, this is not a question of uh, public versus private, that there's too much state and there's hardly any privatization. Uh, it's not simply a question of the amount of resources devoted to the NHS. It is about the way that responsibility for decisions and outcomes has been fragmented and dispersed across far too many bodies, and political accountability has also been lost with that. Okay, brilliant. That's very, very comprehensive. I was very happy to give you a little bit more time on that because it was great. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to go out now. I'm going to have to ask people to be relatively brief. There's plenty of people that want to speak, uh, and I'll try to get through as many as possible before I bring the panel back into for their uh, closing remarks. So, I'm going to take uh, Jenny Cunningham next. Uh, Jenny, could you unmute yourself? Okay. Thanks. Um, well, in as short a time as possible, um, I just want to s one little anecdote. I've worked in the NHS um, for over 30 years in a, in a community setting and retired four years ago. And the General Medical Council uh, told me in an email that they um, were reinstating my registration and reinstating my license to practice, would I like to volunteer during the COVID-19 um, pandemic? Uh, needless to say, and you may or may not condemn me, I declined the offer. And between yourselves and me, wild horses would not drag me back into the NHS. And just a couple of points. I think um, in the first place, I completely agreed with Kate um, about the abysmal record of something like the Public Health England crew, um, which uh, theoretically should have been really at the forefront of managing this pandemic. They've got an abysmal record. And ditto the Scottish uh, public health uh, uh, gang. Um, they have concentrated for years during the time they could have been preparing for, for something like this. They've really concentrated under the guise of protect, prevention um, in being the arm of the nanny state. And I've said, I also really agreed with um, Lee about fragmentation um, because for all this fragmentation, it has spawned huge amounts of bureaucracy. And having lived through perhaps 10, 12 reorganizations of the NHS in Scotland, um, right down to community level, I can assure you for every one of those things, we've tried to adapt as health workers. We've tried to go along with the new things introduced and bureaucracy has just stymied initiative at all levels. And the final thing I would really agree um, with, with, with Kate on is that 
the NHS is really a broken system. It was failing long before COVID-19 and all COVID-19 has done is really amplify all the problems. We really must push at all levels, particularly health workers must come out and say, we've got to look at other health systems at their pluses and their minuses, but above all, we have to say we have to have a new health service. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Carlton Brick, could you uh, unmute yourself? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Just, just following on from uh, what, what Jenny was making the point, again, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, the Scottish experience in terms of uh, NHS Scotland. And as Jenny was pointing out, NHS Scotland was failing long before uh, COVID-19. And, and so it's kind of no surprise that it was, that, it, that it's failed during COVID-19 as it played the main, it was the main vector for uh, the, the, the number of deaths in, in, in Scotland, which are around about 4,000, and the majority of those in care homes, as people have talked about. But I just want to kind of point to that perhaps the, the fault or the blame doesn't necessarily lie with the NHS as such, because it is such a fragmented and such a basket case anyway. But if you look at Scotland in particular, if you look at the kind of devolved nature of NHS care in Scotland, why did Sturgeon and the, uh, the SNP follow uh, the Johnson Tory line with lockdown? Scotland is a very different country. It's a very different population density, very different uh, kind of urban uh, centres. It's more dispersed. So the pandemic was not going to map out in the same way that it would have mapped out in a, in a, in a country like England with a far higher and denser populations. Similarly, Scotland is fairly well isolated from the main kind of global hubs where the, the kind of pandemic is circulated, such as uh, international airports and things like that. So there was a real chat, there was a real, real opportunity on the part of the Scottish uh, government to stand out and make a distinct local decision around uh, fighting the pandemic in Scotland. What they did, they followed the Tory line, and the, the results have been catastrophic. The, the, the principal blame for the pandemic deaths in Scotland is the failure of the political leaders. The, I don't think kind of the NHS is, uh, there are faults, et cetera, et cetera. But as Jenny has said, the NHS was failing long before uh, the COVID-19 in Scotland. However, you know, the kind of the real failure, I think, lies at the heart of the political establishment. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Carlton. Um, Graham Cartmel, again, could you unmute yourself? Thank Go you. Ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I've got to declare I have a vested interest here, um, but I'm not a politician, don't worry. But in 2015, I stood for Parliament on my own initiative about taking politics out of the NHS. Because I seethe with the mismanagement I see and the potential which is just so wasted and frankly for all the wonderful things that have happened in the COVID uh, this crisis effectively NHS has been thrown in it reminds me of being thrown in a rowing boat in a hurricane and the people that have created that rowing boat you've got to go to the basic the, the heart of the matter which is the politicians over 30 years now, this fragmentation, which uh, Lee explained, just showed you so brilliantly, is politicians. This public private uh, split, not so much that, the, the idea of the internal market. Perhaps nobody's mentioned it, but quietly, about a month or so ago, the government wrote off seven or eight hundred million pounds worth of debt, nearly a trillion in the hospitals, which have been part of this market ethos, which puts the whole um, cart and horses through it, doesn't, it doesn't work. The potential for the NHS is wonderful. I don't agree with people that say it's a broken system. It has so much strength, and so you can compare many internationally, and they, there's none that works as well. And we should build on that, 
because it's the fragmentation, fragmentation that has killed it. But we should build on it because why do we have politicians involved? Why do we let them be involved when, in essence, 90% of us agree about this? It. all a question of management. It's not a question of right or left decisions. I challenge you, sorry to go on, but I challenge you to think of a good Minister of Health in the last 30 years. Okay. I bet you can't, can I can't just finish? I mean, to do that, sorry, I can then see all your eyes glaze over and you think, well, it can't be done. It can be done with enough imagination and energy on our part. The politicians, as Henrik have said, will never change themselves. We'll have this conversation in 20 years' time with another pandemic, and the politicians will clearly run it because they take short term self interested decisions. And it's long term and it's complex, and we need a new structure in which to do it. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Graham, right, I'm going to start forcing you to rattle through now. So I'm going to take Claire Fox and then uh, Para and then David West Sussex in that order. So Claire Fox. Oh, sorry, I'm on the music. Yeah, go, go ahead. Thanks, they're very useful. Um, when the crisis was happening around the care workers, so many people just said, why on earth didn't they just come and ask us as care workers? And to a certain extent, and, and, and I also heard similarly people say about the PPE shortages, you know, there was a real frustration. Look, we work in the supply chain around PPE, know what to do. Why didn't you come and ask us? But there was never this kind of conversation happening. And, you know, you can say it's because of bureaucracy uh, on the one hand, but actually there is a real reluctance to be honest about the health service in general. And I think that's going to hold us back. So, you know, I wanted to ask um, the panel because there's been a range of uh, issues in the chat raised and which I've heard about, which is people being warned off speaking to the press or threatened as uh, whistleblowers that they can't speak out. We heard uh, Henrik talk about the fact that an article that he had was <clears throat> threatened with legal action. You know, you can't be honest about this. Um, we've heard from Patrick about how getting information about that report in relation to uh, people with ethnic minorities and COVID or any of these things, all of these things seem to be sidelined um, or, or, or silenced. Or, 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 but I think the greatest problem that we face, uh, which is why it's refreshing to have this discussion, but really how do we tackle it? is that if you actually try and raise any criticism of the NHS, you do actually get treated as though you're, you know, to the right of Genghis Khan and want people to die on trolleys. I mean, there's a, that, that's the danger with the sanctification issue, that you actually, and actually, ironically, it's often care um, uh, NHS workers who try and close down the debate. Whereas it seems to me that in order to be able to resolve any of these things, we need to open up for a frank and open discussion. It, 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 it's, it, it, in other words, it's not just a structural problem. There's a culture that's developed around the, the health service in this country, which means that we can never be honest with each other. We can't argue with each other without being seen as, unless we go along totally and say the NHS is a wonderful thing. So the one thing I'd say in, in terms of what's specific about the COVID crisis is that although it started off that it looked like you'd never be able to criticise it again because they really were being clapped as heroes and that was the end of it, that would be it. Actually, more people now know about Public Health England and every different nook and cranny of the NHS than before. And I think in some ways, even this discussion indicates that what's the job of any of us who care about a decent health service should do is refuse to allow anyone to close the debate down on the basis that if you criticise the NHS or any aspects of it, you're anti-NHS and are kind of like trying to do a Trump. I mean, Kate Andrews and I disagree on the NHS, but it drives me mad that every time she opens her mouth and says anything on the NHS, she's attacked as being an apologist for Trump who wants to privatise the NHS and that's the end of the story. We've got to be able to have a much fairer and more open, uh, frank discussion on it, it seems to me. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, Para, could you unmute yourself? Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, I really agreed with um, Lee, I think, who said that we need a public debate about the kind of healthcare 
uh, we want in society. Now, it's quite clear from the panel, uh, everyone talked about the structure, poor management, increase of spending. So I want to ask what people thought that in a society as of now, as we are today, where everything that we face, the ups and downs of life are all looked through the prism of illness, if you like. And it's really clear to me, uh, for instance, at work, where uh, all the discussions about uh, well-being, mental health, and the presumption very much is that, uh, you know, um, you have to aspire to be well, which means none of us are well, uh, we are all vulnerable, we need help. So I'd like to understand where that fits in with the kind of health service we need, because it seems to me that it's because we live in that culture that when COVID struck us, uh, there was this clamor to protect the NHS because for a long time now, demand supersedes everything else we've thrown at it. So how do people, uh, what are people's views uh, uh, on this? Okay, brilliant. thank you very much. David West Sussex again, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Yeah, but, um, David, my name's David from uh, West Sussex. Yeah, um, my, my experience of the, um, uh, the NHS and social care comes from 10 years as a family carer. Uh, first of all, caring for my partner at home and then caring for her when she well, supporting her care in the care home. And it was an interesting experience because my mother worked in adult social care in the 1970s when it was run by the local authorities and it was privatised. It was privatised. And it's now become a system where profits are the most important thing. And I don't can't imagine how people in care homes have coped in the last uh, few weeks, because back in 2016, 2017, when I was still visiting my late partner in that care home, um, the, the staff were absolutely stretched to the limit. They didn't have enough equipment. Um, some of them were go coming to work physically tired. So we need to do something about that. If the crisis does anything, it, it raises the issue of we need to, uh, you know, really reform social care and make it a system that's fit for purpose. On the NHS, um, important make on the NHS and re re partly response to what Claire said, you don't have to privatise something to change its ethos. I worked in the state body, and I won't name it, but I worked in the state body for 25 years. And when I joined it, it was run as a public service. And by the time I left it, it was being run like it was a commercial operation and the NHS has become that combined with as other people have said lots of bureaucracy with very very highly paid people um, getting lots of money for setting targets and all the rest of it but budgets are the most important thing to to the NHS the reason people were, were sent to care homes back into care homes is because it gets them off the NHS budget I had an experience recently my mum was in hospital and not COVID Fortunately, she had a fall, they gave her a bit of care, and then it was all about we've got to get her home, we've got to get her home, got to get her onto the care budget because that gets us off the NHS budget. So that's another, another issue that needs addressing. The NHS did, does need changing. The original idea was brilliant, but it's not the NHS that was created in 1948. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Those insights. I have to say, my wife used to work in social care, and there's lots of people working in local authority social care in Scotland. And all of the same problems are there uh, in terms of staff shortages and lack of resources and all, all of that stuff. So um, I think there's a general problem with social care um, that we have to confront. Right, I've got James Woodhouse, and, and then that's it in terms of audience contributions. I'm going to come back to the panel, and I'm going to take Kate first when I do so, because... I think she's on the clock. Um, so, uh, uh, James, if you'd like to unmute yourself, far away. Well, I've got to say, as a, a, a lifelong leftist, I'm much more worried about the state in the NHS than I am about privatisation. I think you'll find that James Mill, the father of John Stuart Mill, described imperialism as a vast system of outdoor relief for the upper classes. And I think when we look at the bureaucracy in the NHS, a personal experience of this, there was a complete smokescreen consultation launched about what would otherwise be called cuts 
in the constituency where I fought in the general election in around uh, southwest London, Epsom and so on. And uh, there they did a smokescreen consultation to get everybody to agree locally, the uh, local populace, to actually four new beds on top of a thousand between now and 2030. So uh, I think Mpara is quite right to talk about how they've whipped up demand in what's known as the worried well among the middle classes at the same time as they suddenly discount it when they're doing a consultation exercise. And then to, when they saw it all through behind the back of the, the virus locally, the local chief executive uh, said uh, the significant thing was that uh, 268 of 274 of our senior medical staff, 98%, have signed a letter supporting the uh, community care groups proposals. So you've got, uh, you know, no, nearly total unanimity of 274 consultants and senior clinicians, all of them earning at least 100,000 a year, the unanimity that there's going to be no aging of the population, no transport congestion, no problems getting people to a smaller hospital and all of that, and that they've got it all sussed out, including the money and the estates and everything else, till 2030. And I've got to say to Patrick, having been at one of these trust meetings, the one thing that they did want to talk about, I was not allowed to speak, but they talked about at length was bullying of black people, which I'm sure goes on in the local trust. What they wouldn't talk about was just how deceitful, undemocratic and parsimonious they were being given the state of real demand, not worried well demand that Paro was discussing. It was a complete fake, the whole thing. So I'm sympathetic to fighting racism all my life and certainly where it exists in the NHS. But I want to ask Patrick, do you recognize what I recognize, which was when a whole lot of people going on about bullying of black staff were actually using it in this case, not every case, but in this case, they were certainly using it as a smoke screen. Uh, to get around it all. So I think we've got to take a, a much more critical attitude to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy that has led to thousands of unnecessary deaths through the separation of the care home sector, ladies and gentlemen, from the NHS sector and this obsession with hospitals that we've got when in fact all the trends in, uh, the, in healthcare generally go beyond hospitals. Uh, for the future. So that's the emphasis I would put. And Trump's welcome to, you know, half a little annex or a car park if he can find one off the NHS. But that tail is not wagging. The privatization tail is not wagging the NHS dog the way the bureaucracy is. Right. Okay. So I'm going to come back to the panel. I'm going to take Kate first. Uh, well, and then if, if that's okay, okay to Patrick and. Um, I can. Oh, sorry. I can hang on if Patrick wants to respond directly because I know those questions were put to Patrick. So I'm, I'm happy to hang on if he wants to do that. Oh, okay. okay, so let's take Patrick first then. Um, fresh, fresh response to uh, all of that. So. Uh, well, thanks for all the questions for tonight. I mean, in terms of the last question, I mean, I've, I've got nothing more to say apart from, it depends on the context of that debate that took place at the NM, at the NHS meeting that you attended. What I can say is, um, just like with the whole Black Lives Matter um, impact in Britain, everyone's now talking about race. And, and because of the COVID-19 situation, and NHS England had to issue guidance because the way of the disproportionality of BME staff dying on the front line, um, then we have to have a conversation about that. So I think it's quite important. The bullying stuff is real. I've, I know lots of people who've been bullied, nurses, senior clinicians, um, it's everyday racism, call it what you like. So, and if we want to have a world-class service, an inclusive service, and a service that means the needs of the community, they need to have staff that are, feel confident, that they've got the support of their management, and they can deliver. And if you've been bullied and harassed, and it has an impact on, your, on you, you can't deliver, you can't be affecting that delivery. So I think it's right and proper, as well as the issue around sexism as well. That's a big issue also uh, in, in the health service as well. In terms of the... Um, the question that a lot of questions have been raised about um, uh, about funding, and the point I did make, Kate, I think you misread me. I said 
I wasn't talking about the NHS funding. I was talking about comparing Europe spending on GDP on healthcare, and and Britain's health funding on, uh, on GDP on healthcare is not that fantastic. And I think as a result of COVID nineteen, I think there's going to be a conversation about the funding of the NHS as well as social care, and 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 actually a, a, a significant conversation about how you can have that parity. If you remember, there was this conversation by the coalition government about parity of esteem and about social care should be in the same status as uh, all aspects of healthcare. The COVID-19 has exposed there is no parity of esteem. Um, that's quite important. Uh, the other issues that's been um, raised was about the whole stuff around politics. Let's face it, the NHS was created by Labour government after the Second World War and it was a socialist democratic program of free healthcare at the point of access. That was the creation of the NHS in 1948. Obviously, things have moved on since then, but politics has always been in healthcare. That is, prob that is probably one of the downfalls because we've had so much, every three years, there's always a restructuring. Politicians like to put no better than the community, service users and clinicians, and they decide that they want to restructure the healthcare to suit their, their perspective, their values, or whatever it is. Um, and, but it's, and it has been political. And so for frontline staff, and I know this, because I know some frontline staff who have been bullied, so if you go to speak on Channel 4 or ITV, you know, this might affect your career. It's like hints which is bullying and harassment, basically. So I think the NHS has been political. The, the political decision that politicians need to make uh, in, in, in a dialogue with us as taxpayers is about the distribution of, how, of, the, of the spend and how much money do we want to invest in healthcare in Britain. That is a political decision based on political manifestos. And, and, and but our job is to shape to make sure that it meets um, delivery and particularly around health and outcomes as well. The final point I, I want to make is about moving forward. And I know one of the key issues around the NHS, it's a massive, you know, uh, you know, someone sent me, I uh, saw some message in the chat that uh, actually it's, um, it's one, we know we're not, it's, I said one in, I said that, uh, it, that the NHS is the third largest employer in the world. I've been challenged on that. Well, it's really matter. it's with the largest, with the largest employer in Britain. And if you include the social care sector, it's a massive sector. In a post-recession, in we're approaching a recession, the NHS is going to be even more critical around delivery uh, as well. And I think the question that we, I think all of us need to think about is what sort of healthcare system do we want to have? And what do we do as individuals, as taxpayers, uh, try and be active in our taking more responsibility for our health and well-being? And, and also, do we want to have an NHS which is more decentralised at a local level. So local people are involved in decision making. Unfortunately, when you're sitting on the board of an NHS organisation, I've, I've been a non-exec on quite a few organisations, everyone defers to the centre or feeding the beast. It's not, it's not about feeding local people. That has to change. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Now, Kate, please respond or to that or anything else. Thanks so much. Um, Yes, quickly to, to Claire Fox's point, it's always a treat to be hosted by the Academy of Ideas because um, these are some of the few polite, you know, really detailed, interesting conversations that you get about something as a motive as the NHS. Um, you can't have these kinds of conversations elsewhere. So it really is always a treat. And to Claire's point, it is really important that we talk about the failings. We have all been locked down for months now, many people alone, distressed, having, you know, really bad effect on their me mental health, let alone the physical health of, of getting COVID or knowing people who did. And we did that because we all value human life and we value it for ourselves, but also for people we've never met. And if anything, this, this crisis needs to translate into us caring about the cancer patients and the stroke patients and everybody else who goes through the NHS when it's not a global pandemic. Um, and I thought that Jenny's testament to her time working in the NHS and a lack of desire to go back, if we can put it that way, was was um, really important. And the kind of stories that we need to hear from people who have lived the NHS and, and, and worked in it. I think Jenny's story matters a lot more than a lot of the, the pundits and, and the politicians who would speak to it. Um, Para asked where, how do we, how do we go forward? And, 
And um, I think that ties in nicely to, to Carlton's point about why Sturgeon decided to follow Boris Johnson's strategy. And that's because at the end of the day, regardless of what's devolved, and, and I, I definitely take place, Lee's point about fragmentation, this is still a very, very centralized system where it is very difficult to try new things and stray away from the norm. And that fragmentation, looking at those spreadsheets, really represents an extremely bloated state. And a lot of people are going to call after this crisis for money, for more money to go into the NHS. I, I've always thought that more money probably has to go into the NHS, but we have to ask ourselves, is this the kind of NHS that you wanted to go into? Do people really believe after this crisis that, that money is going to go to more ICU beds, to more capacity into frontline workers, or is it going to pour into public health England, which leading up to this pandemic, we're spending double on things like the obesity epidemic is what they called it, than actually preparing for a global pandemic. And I'm certainly not convinced, and I think a lot of people won't be convinced that an increase in funding in this structure will translate to better health outcomes. So for me, it's about those health, health outcomes. It's what systems, what structures can deliver the best healthcare outcomes. Brilliant, thank you very much, Kate. Uh, can I bring in Henrik now, if that's okay? So Henrik. Your final thoughts. Thank you very much, Rob, and actually thank you for this. It's been a great debate, uh, as usual, with the Academy of Ideas. Um, for somebody who's been working in the NHS for quite a long time, I have to say the worst thing about it um, is the excessive number of tick boxes you have to deal with. Uh, some people have, have touched on it before, but the bureaucracy is incredible. Uh, and I came to think of that when, when Jenny Cunningham was talking about uh, being offered to be reinstated on the GMC list. Uh, I've got a good friend who, who uh, was offered the same thing, but he gave up because of the numerous forms he had to fill in, including getting a new uh, DBS check uh, before he could then go into a COVID ward and, and, and treat. Uh, we do have far, far too much bureaucracy. The idea, the, the, the problem about social care and the relation with the hospitals. I believe that, that uh, they changed the, the ministry now. So the Department of Health is now the Department of Health and Social Care. Uh, presumably somebody in their wisdom thought that that was going to help uh, on this one. Uh, the problem with bed blockers, as they are, uh, you know, lovingly called, um, is a problem that you have uh, in, other prop in, in other countries as well. I remember Denmark about 30 years ago started to charge local authorities if they left people in a hospital bed longer. And the problem here, again, is a bit like the tick boxes, right? The problem is that if you're moving people from a hospital to um, a council-run uh, care home, this, the government is going to pay whichever bed the person is in. It's just a question of which cigar box the money is taken out of. And actually, the NHS uh, spends a lot of time trying to work out how to take the money out of a different cigar box uh, than their own. Um, to Claire, I mean, it, it's hardly a surprise that, that I agree with Claire uh, as usual. Uh, I really do agree uh, with that we have to be able to criticize the NSS without being looked upon as, as uh, Genghis Khan. Um, but I have to say, and I think, I think really what we all agree on is that the NHS should be free at the point of delivery, as, as Patrick was, was, was uh, talking about before, free at the point of delivery. Whether that then is delivered by somebody in a private company or somebody uh, in, in, a, in a public company, it, it's not really, from my mind, not the most important thing. The important thing is that you get quality and that it is free at point of delivery. Apart from, of course, that if you talk to a dentist or pharmacist, they always get pissed off about this because obviously, it is not free at the point of delivery uh, where we come from. My last thing has to do uh, with, and somebody touched on that, that uh, about privatization of the NHS. Uh, the Labour slogan about NHS is not for sale. If you look at it, and it's partly to do with the European Union and the competition directive, but actually the NHS has already been sold. Um, the, the problem is that, and that was actually during uh, Tony Blair's years, uh, there is a requirement to go up for tender for even reasonably small contracts within the NHS uh, has to be tendered out. We've just had it in dentistry. Uh, orthodontic practices, the ones with braces, have all been sent out for tender. It has been a complete nightmare. They haven't saved any money, and it has cost them millions of pounds to do it. 
uh, and, and it has been a, a disaster. NSS has already been sold. They have this thing about it has to go out for tender, even on small contracts. That is one of the things that has to change as well. It had to be up to the local areas to decide whether they really need to do a big exercise or whether they can just get the best people in to do the job. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Hendrik. Uh, finally, Lee, if you unmute yourself and give us your final thoughts. No, thank you. And um, like the others, I'd like to thank the Academy of Ideas for organising um, this important debate. Um, and I would also like to plug um, Kate's interview on trigonometry, which is an interesting podcast where she talks about different models of healthcare delivery, because that's the kind of debate that we need to be having about um, how we deliver healthcare. That's the fundamental question. And I, and I would just want to close by talking about the, um, the religion uh, issue and uh, the honest debate issue that Claire has raised. So what is the root? What are the, what are the aspects of religiosity when it comes to the NHS? I think it's twofold. One is people respect doctors and nurses, especially doctors. So they're the most trusted people in society. So if you, if you want to become an MP, you should first become a local GP. Um, and they admire the way people put themselves on the line to serve the community. And that's a healthy um, that's a healthy thing. The second element of the religiosity is the desire to have healthcare that is free at the point of need uh, for everybody. And it is um, the last real relic in some ways of the post-war welfare state, which in many respects has been hollowed out and dismantled over the last 30 years. And when people talk about changing the NHS, there is a deep mistrust, a deep popular mistrust of change because people have seen over the last 30, 40 years that every time something changes with respect to the welfare state, it gets worse. It means fewer services, less provision. Um, even when taxes don't ever seem to go down, they never seem to go up. Because of this bizarre combination of the market and the state, which I call market Stalinism, that is the reason. And that's why it's so difficult to have a conversation in this country about the way that public services are delivered, because all people have seen is the opening up of public services to private companies and profiteering that haven't, as Henrik has said, they haven't delivered efficiency gains. They have, as in the case of PPE, been disastrous. So I don't think, as some people have suggested, that you can depoliticize healthcare and shut the politicians out because politics are fundamentally is about who gets what, how and when. And that includes health, includes healthcare services. But if we are to have a debate in this country about how healthcare and anything else is delivered, then it has to take place on the basis of a consensus and principles. For example, we cannot sacrifice the idea that healthcare should be free to everybody uh, and available to everybody that needs it. And that is what people fear will be taken away from them because of a mistrust in politics and the way that privatization has gone over the next 30, 40 years, it will not be possible to move forward on the NHS until a new social compact, a new social contract, if you like, is developed between uh, the political class and the rest of the population. And that will take, I think, an enormous amount of effort and vision on the part of our political leaders. Uh, and I think that is sorely lacking. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I would like to unmute you all, but if you would like to unmute yourselves, give our panel a round of applause. I think it's been excellent. So it's been yeah. Thank you. Really good, everyone. That was really excellent. Really good. Nice to think about. Right. Okay. I've I've just muted you all again. I'm sorry. Uh, just a, just a, a couple of final things. So um, as I uh, mentioned at the start, if you enjoyed this and you want to uh, contribute to us continuing these these kinds of discussions, because we haven't got any money, um, then please uh, do uh, pop over to academyofideas.org.uk forward slash donate. And uh, whatever you can give us, that will be greatly appreciated in terms of uh, maintaining this level of public debate. And, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see you at many more. Uh, in terms of what's coming up uh, next Tuesday, 
we have a book launch for Professor Frank Ferreira's new book, Why Borders Matter, which should be a fascinating debate as well. Uh, and I don't think it's just about international borders or anything, it's about all sorts of borders. It's a very interesting thesis he's got, so do join us for that uh, next Tuesday. Uh, that's it for tonight's meeting. Uh, if you want to hang around, the, the, I'll keep the Zoom meeting over, open for a little while longer just so you can have a bit of a chat. But thank you again to our, to our speakers. And thank you to all of you for your contributions. Good evening.